Okay, hope you had a good week of, of enriching yourselves. Um, so, this week, spatial SQL. And really, after this week, that's all the material, should be all the materials you really need to do the assignment after this week. So, everything else is kind of. Um, So after this, uh, there'll be a lot less code in the talks, a lot more sort of expansive, a lot more colour, and a lot more. We'll expand our minds a little bit rather than concentrating uh, in detail at the various code. So a bit of a change of just kind of style content. Okay, so this is the basic layout of the lecture. I'll start off with just considering our DBMSs, Relational Database Management Systems, and GIS, their relationship. We touched on that, a little bit of that right at the beginning of the, I think, in the first lecture, and touch on it again, or maybe the second lecture, touch on it again first. And I'll introduce Postgres, the PostGIS extension to Postgres. Then we'll go through some PostGIS SQL syntax, give you some examples of how, how, those, how, how it uses how uh, the PostGIS SQL syntax operates, and then finally a little bit about actually the connection between PostGIS and Quantum GIS. Well, we should be all familiar with what relational databases are, uh, data stored in tables, but as we know, not all data is optimally tabular, and that there are diff difficulties in representing particularly types of data spatial data types, hence the development of GIS as a separate uh, development program to relational databases, and also uh, these parent-child relationships, these tree-like relationships, which are very common. Uh, and the, as a result of these, the relational database not being a good model for those, we've had the recent development of uh, modern network databases, but also things like XML, which will meet next year. Um, extendable markup language is one way of storing parent-child relationships between objects and data. Well, geographical information system, hopefully you, you've, you know what those are. A million definitions, yeah. Computer store system storing, manipulating, displaying geographically referenced data, um, but maybe also include the people and the personnel involved in collecting that data into a sort of full entire system. So I think we did see this slide briefly, but hopefully now there's perhaps a little bit more understanding of what, what this slide is showing. So basically this is historical. Um, well, it's kind of historical, but it's not to say that the first generation GIS is not being used every day all over the place today. These are models that have been sort of developed through time, but the, they, they're still, the earlier models are still perfectly valid and used. So initially, we had proprietary GIS. The GIS tools, in this case, refer to things like the mapping interface, the interface that the person uses. That interface accesses uh, or is an interface onto the GIS engine, the, the, the engine that's, that actually does the geospatial manipulations, so overlay, intersections, all that kind of stuff, done in the GIS engine. And they were accessing the spatial data stored in a proprietary, you know what I mean by proprietary, it's basically closed off commercial database system. So this was a very closed system. Think, um, think ArcGIS. Uh, have you come across file geo databases? Yeah, yep. Okay. So think ArcGIS file data, data databases being accessed by ArcMap. Uh, so that's still the kind of architecture that ArcGIS sort of operates. A lot of companies, organisations had relational database systems. That's how they stored most of their data, all the data which was not inherently ge in the GIS, geographical data. And wanted to connect that to the geographical data. So what happened in, presumably we were in the sort of mid-1980s by now, 
I reckon, early 90s. The, the information stored in corporate relational database systems, wanted to be, they wanted to integrate that with the spatial data stored in the GIS. So SQL links were developed between the GIS data engine to access the non-spatial data stored in relational database systems. So now you have a sort of dual system. You have your uh, attribute data, most of your attribute non-spatial attribute data associated with non-spatial entities stored in your corporate relational database, but your geometry is basically still in a separate proprietary geographical database. So we had this dual system developed. And then what's happened now in the third generation, which basically probably started about 15, 20, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, the first uh, sort of third generation GIS developed. I think it was the first one I came across was Oracle 8 spatial, spatial whatever they called it, those cartridge, I, I never remember what they called them, uh, which was probably in the early 90s, late 80s, early, well, that must be early 90s now. Uh, in this case, all data, spatial data, as we know, has now been migrated within to a standard relational database system, and then a relational database, and then you have a single database engine, uh, single database engine, RDB, spatial RDBMS engine, so the functionality, the spatial overlay, all the spatial functionality, which was in a separate GIS engine, is now migrated into the relational database as an extension. So all data, spatial and aspatial, can now be stored in a rel single relational database, accessed through a spatial relational database management system, which the GIS tools, the mapping interfaces, QGIS, etc., uh, can access through SQL. Okay, so we've had this gradual merging of the, spatial, of the spatial model with the relational model. The, not really the merging, it's more the sort of adding on of the spatial component. And of course, Postgres, PostGIS is of this third generation. So Postgres, well, it's uh, advertised as the world's most advanced free and open source relational database system. Sometimes called an object relational database system, sometimes not. Uh, it's, we'll go on, as I say, we'll have a lecture on objects in due course and we can uh, discuss whether it's an object-based system or not if we feel that way inclined. It all depends on what you define objects as or what your requirement definition of an object is. As we know, supports custom data types, functions, and operations, and runs either as a Windows servant service or a Linux daemon. So here you are. If you open your services, if you go to Windows, if you've got a local install of Postgres, you type services. These are all the programs that are kind of running in the background on your Windows machine. As you can see, one of them here is the Postgres server. PostGIS is that spatial extension for Postgres SQL. It's a free and open source project, but it's kind of spearheaded or one of the main uh, companies involved in this is Rare Fractions Research. I'm not 100% certain where they're based, but they do have a office somewhere in North London, I think, as well. So basically, this is a company that makes its uh, living out of developing PostGIS, and, but mostly from selling services to, for, in, for uh, implementing PostGIS databases. If you understand the database and you develop it, then people will come to you when they need an application developed in Postgres. They need a consultancy. So these companies make their, their money through selling their services and they can provide a better service if they're intimately involved in the development of these free open source products. And increasingly, this is a business model, as I'm sure you're aware, that's, it, it, that's growing in the open source world. We're currently on version 2.1, as of Portable GIS version 5. So what does it do? It supports both planar, so projected onto a plane surface, 
and geographic latitude and longitude on a spheroid data. So it, so it supports both planar and geographic data. The support for planar data is much greater, or certainly was in previous versions, uh, than geogra the geographic data. In the previous, in certainly version one of post uh, postgis, the support for geographic data, lat long data on a sphere, was very quite limited. I think it's increased a great deal in the new version, but I don't know whether it's fully caught up. So beware of that. Certain function functionality may only be supported a planar data set. And indeed, that's true for ArcGIS. In fact, in ArcGIS, most functionality is only supported on a plane. Try doing an interpolation on a sphere in ArcGIS, and you're not going anywhere. It doesn't happen. It doesn't work. They don't support that. They're going that way, but they don't support it at the moment. It supports both 2D, 3D data types, so spatial dimension, XY dimensions, XYZ dimensions, both raster and vector data types. I know next to nothing about raster data in postgis I hasten to add, so we're all, I'm only talking about vector data types, but if you're interested, it does support raster. It's on my list of things to teach myself one day. It includes a transaction management system, indexing, and query planner. So not only is it uh, the data types, but you also have to have add-in to your relational database management system the, the, the programs that plan the queries, execute the queries. You've got new types of indexes needing supporting. So you've got a whole new sort of query planner add-on for the spatial component. It supports extended SQL, so we can put spatial um, functions and operations into SQL, standard SQL uh, statements, which is really, really powerful. And it's got a number of extensions to PostGIS. Probably the most common one you come across maybe is called PG routing. I think it's actually PG underscore routing, which is the network tracing and network modeling extension to PostGIS. So for doing sort of drive times, drive distances along networks and things like that. Uh, but there are also other ones as well. There's a topology extension for maintaining topology between your your data sets. Uh, that, I was reading about that last week, and that's sort of still in semi-development. Often, with these open source solutions, they're running, it's difficult to say, because in some functionality, they may be running behind people like ArcGIS by a few years, maybe five, 10, 10 years. Certainly, the QGIS interface until very recently, and in still a bit bit clunky in my opinion, but it's a lot better than it was compared with the rather smooth ArcGIS interface. But also, there are certain functionalities, because it's all open source, that have been implemented by users uh, in PostGIS that are may, not, may not be generally available in ArcGIS. So there may be some things that are better than commercial products, some things that are worse, not surprisingly. And for us, and in one thing is important for PostGIS, PostGIS tries and indeed implements the OGC, the Open Geodata Consortium Standards, simple S, it's called OGC SQL MM simple feature standards. What that is, is a set of standards defined by the Open Geographic um, Geospatial Consortium that define the functions the functions that the spatial database should support and how what they do. Okay, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about standards in later lectures. And when it comes to PostGIS, all the functions which have ST, capital ST underscore in front of them, are OGCC, OGC compliant. Other functions that ha don't have this ST underscore in front of them are not OGC compliant. So it tries really hard to be OGC compliant, and I believe it implements all these, this particular standard, 
but there's other parts of the OGC standards, for example, to do with raster data or something like that, where it's maybe not fully implemented. And more. So it does more than the OGC standards require as well. So the architecture. Well, the architecture is simply how things are arranged, the components and how they're arranged in the system. So this is a sort of just a, a diagram showing the post, how PostGIS uh, stands in relation to PostgreSQL. So PostgreSQL supports your relational data types, your tables. It's got all the functionality for tables, functions supporting how to define functions, how to define indexes, non-spatial indexes, triggers. Triggers are things that happen when, uh, the, the, when something else happens. So if I enter a bit of data into this record, and if it needs to create a new record in another table, you'd have a trigger that would then create a new record in the table. You might have a trigger that created a new record in the table. And it contains a query planner for uh, the non-spatial data types for the standard SQL queries. The PostGIS extension adds spatial data types. It adds spatial functions. It adds spatial indexes. And it adds a spatial query planner that integrates into the relational query planner. PostGIS works and operates. It's not all programmed into PostGIS. The extension. The, the extension exists within PostGIS, but the functionality, a lot of the functionality, is actually done by a, a variety of external libraries. So the PROJ4J library, I can't remember whether I've got slides for these or these. So we've got a number of external libraries that these spatial functions call. PROJ4 is a projection library that projects, that, that supports the reprojection of data. Geos, well, I think I've got slides on these actually. I've got slides on these. Let's have a look. Yeah, okay. So here we go. So these libraries are getting called because I can't remember exactly what these are. Geos is a C++. C++ is just a programming language. Port, just version of what's called the Java topology suite. Java being yet another program language, and that supports. All OGC simple features for SQL standards plus other. So basically, when you want to do a spatial overlay in PostGIS, PostGIS gets the data from the tables, the spatial data from the tables, chucks that data over to the GEOS library, which is outside, it's linked to the PostGIS database, but it's not actually embedded in Postgres. And that library returns the result to Postgres, which then display gives it to the user. It also calls what's called the GDAL, which is, uh, G I can never remember what it stands for, GDAL, General uh, something library, data analysis library or something. And that, it uses the GDAL library for raster processing. So if it's doing some kind of raster function, chances are it'll be calling out to the GDAL library, which is another C library, returns the, the raster result. If you want to do a reprojection of data, then it's going to call the PROJ4 library, which is a C library for cartographic projection. And there also are some other libraries that are called libxml2, json-c. These are parsing libraries that read XML extended markup language or JSON, which is another type of markup language for storing spatial data. So this is sort of in-out import-export functions that call these other libraries. And it's, you know, it's useful, nice thing to do. These libraries, these same libraries, underlie virtually every open source GIS program that is out there and indeed is integrated into many, several commercial products as well because the licensing of these, the particular licensing allows these things to be used and integrated into commercial products. So commercial products actually run, use these same libraries 
some of them to implement their functionality. And what you're paying for is the interface as much onto these functions. Uh, so these underlie many proprietary and geospatial programming tools, in quantum GIS, MAPNIC, GRASS, and other libraries. Okay, so let's move on to some jolly code. Postgres needs to be enabled. This is a new thing, and I think I hadn't updated the documentation instructions uh, in the practicals. So this is a, I think you, if I haven't updated them, then you must do this. So whenever you install, whenever you want to run, a, create a, a spatial database, you need to create the extension postgres. In the previous version of Portable GIS, the previous version of, of um, postgres, when it was postgres 1, the, you did it in a different way. And basically, when you started up, you, you, you had a different, uh, you didn't need to do this. So you need to do this create extension PG, postgres. And if you want to access any of the other additional functionalities, additional extensions, so if you want to enable the topology extension, then you type create extension postgres topology. Uh, and there are also other ones, so PostGIS Advanced 3D and other geoprocessing algorithms are available in this extension as well. Why, don't, why doesn't it just load the whole load up? Well, you're bloating your database with stuff that you don't need, providing functionality that's not required. In general, for IT systems, keep things as simple as possible, minimize things as possible. So when you run the extension, what you get is it installs a number of data objects in your Postgres database. And as you can here, this is probably the most, well, the most important, but the, the stuff you're most interested in in many ways is the functions. So I've loaded, I've created the extension, and that's created 1,049 new functions in the public schema in my spatial relational database. Uh, I'm just going to point out here that all these ones at the top of the list have this underscore in front of them. No ST, they have an underscore. Now what an underscore generally represents in this situation and often does if you start a name with an underscore, it means that it's something that the user never directly calls but is called by other functions. So chances are you would never use the function underscore add raster constraint. That's a function that's caused by other functions, other SQL functions. So bear that in mind. You want to use the ones that are ST underscore or just start with a word. The ones with an underscore are internal things, basically. Not to be used. And as we can see, we highlight, I think, one add raster constraints. So I've got highlighted this one, and we can see, as usual, we get the function on the right hand side. It's not very informative, particularly. Uh, in fact, I can't understand what it's actually doing by reading that. It's, it's SQ, using the SQL, which is passed in as. as as a, some sort of text. We don't need to worry about what that's doing. It's hidden within the system. It's not just functions that are loaded up. Uh, we've also got one table called spatial ref sys. A couple of triggers. Never had to deal with triggers in my life, so I'm not sure what they're doing. They're internal things that it needs to operate. And four views. Geography columns, geometry columns, raster columns, and raster overviews. And if you remember, views are saved SQL queries onto the database. So these are not tables, these are saved queries that return a table. So we'll go through these system, system tables. Spatial refsys. This table stores the parameters for all the coordinate systems stored in your database. And if you open up the table, you can just open it up in the viewer, 
you can see we've got a number of fields, SRID, author name, author SRID, and then SR text and proj for J text. Okay. Now, oops, oops. Okay. So the SRID is called the, is the spatial reference system identifier, and that is the primary key of the spatial ref system. So this is storing spatial reference, it's spatial coordinate systems. The auth name is the authority that's, that's published that, or is publishing that, um, that, that coordinate system. So if we go up, we can see that all these in this list are authored by the EPSG. Who are EPSG? EPSG are the European Petroleum Survey Group. Uh, which is a organ which is maintained by the oil and gas producers surveying and positioning committee. So basically, surveyors, petroleum companies needed to know they needed they, they had a, uh, a strong need for accurate coordinate systems to be able to transform data to between, co between various coordinate systems, and they were one of the first organisations that started to collate coordinate systems into a single place, into a single form. And they are one of the major authoring authorities in the world, but there are others. Author, auth SRID is the identifier, the unique identifier from the issuing authority. So we've got SRID, which is our unique identifier in my database. The SRID, author SRID, is the identi identifier from the issuing authority. So in this case, their unique number is 2,000. Our unique number just happens to be 2,000 as well. But we might get this same projection system, projection coordinate system from another supplier who might have a different unique identifier from their system for the same coordinate system. Finally, we have the two fields, SR text and proj 4 j text. And what those are, they are text fields that contain the coordinate system parameters in two different formats. Uh, I can't remember, I'm not an expert on coordinate systems, but the PROJ4 text is the format that's passed to the PROJ4 library. So that's why PROJ4 text is in there. SR text, not, not really sure when that's used, to be honest. But. So two different stored in two different formats. Exactly the same data, just presented in different ways, I think. Oh, is this a text? Maybe that's a text description, actually, and that's the coordinate, that's the actual coordinate parameters. That may be the case. Well, that's got the, this one contains the NAD, the data, and things like that. Okay. We can add coordinate systems. And indeed, I had to do this once. Uh, so here, I want to insert into spatial refsys a new coordinate system. This is a Lambert conformal conic projection for Mexico, for where I work in Mexico. And these, so I can do insert into spatial reference system. I insert the SRID, the auth name, the auth SRD, the text, and the two text fields. And here are my various values. Note I don't have a value for the PROJ4 text here. I only have it for the SR text. And then when I do select star from spatial system where SRID equals my new SRID number, there it is. There's my new projection inserted into spatial ref system. Note, I don't actually need the PROJ4 text. I only need this seemingly for it to operate. Where do I get that from? Well. I got that from, from, from spatialreference.org, which is an incredibly useful site if you're looking for coordinate systems for various places in the world. Uh, this returns, you can find lots of search for reference for coordinate systems and return the data in a wide, get the, in a wide variety of 
of formats. So it's just spatialreferencesystem.org. And indeed, you can submit your own coordinate systems to this database. This is an open uh, database of coordinate systems. So here I type in Mexico, search, and I get returned a whole variety of coordinate systems with Mexico connected to Mexico. Obviously, some of them have to do with New Mexico, so we're not interested in those. But notice there's, there's 6,700, a Lambert conformal comet for Mexico. There are a conformal comet on a Lambert. So you've got to be quite careful because there are several versions of a very similar, of the Lambert conformal comic projection in Mexico. Some of these might be on WGS 84 spheroid. Some may be on the Clark, a, in this case, the Clark 1886 spheroid. So they'll be slightly different. Also, you may have duplicates in here because it was somebody submitted the same version where it already exists on the database. So all bear that in mind. But this is a great place. If you need a coordinate system for somebody in, somewhere in the world, this is a great place to look. You can see there's probably quite a lot of just testing inserts as well. So if we click on that, I've clicked on SRORG38. Uh, and which is uh, my Mexico Lambert conformal conic. And I can, on the left-hand side here, I've got this in a variety of formats. I click on the Postgres insert option. So Postgres says insert. And that's my insert statement. Copy, paste that into my. And there we go. Away I go. So that's how you get coordinate systems. Or well, one way to get coordinate systems. So the other objects that were, were loaded up were four different views. Uh, and remember, views are saved SQL queries onto uh, the database. Now, Postgres 2 uses the Postgres system catalogs to store system metadata. What, what do I mean by that? Well, what does it store? It, it can store things like what, which columns contain spatial data, what is the spatial data type, that kind of overview information on the, on the, on the data. And we'll see, the, see some examples in a minute. See some. It also things, stores things like raster origin, how many bands in a raster, uh, a, a raster image, cell size. So all this stuff that you need to know that says where is the spatial data in our database and all the sort of metadata, system metadata that tells the computer how to display it or how to how best to analyze it. In contrast to certainly shape files and I believe file geodatabases, um, although I'd have to check on that, tables in Postgres may you have more than one geometry column in the same table. So a shape file can only ever store, has one geometry column called shape, which either stores points, lines, or polygons. In Postgres, it's far more flexible, so you could have one table for city, and you could have, store in that, you could have one column in that city called polygon geom, that stores the city as a polygon, and another column in that same table called point geom, which could store the point at the centroid of that city, or a point location for that city. So that's uh, immediately something new that you couldn't do in, uh, you can't do in many, most sort of standard GIS, you can't do in shape points. Also, although this is generally not advised, is you can store more than one type of geometry in a geometry column. So you can have a geometry collection or a geometry bag column, which just allows you to throw points in lines in polygons all into the same table column. 
But clearly, if you start doing things like that, then you're, very, you're, you're, you're becoming quite restricted on what you can act to functions that you can actually apply to that data set. But it might be useful once in a while if you need some kind of large dump of data or something like that. So what is possible and what is sensible are maybe two different things. So the geometry columns view. So the ge geometry, geometry refers to planar data, projected data. Geography refers to data on a sphere or a sphere like that. So if we, I've loaded some data up. This is a sort of, you know, looks like the Kingston, a version of the Kingston Environment Database. So I've loaded some data up. We'll get on to how you load data up in a minute. And I do select star from geography columns, and that returns the table. Or it's not returning a table, it's returning the view, because this data has been extracted from the Postgres system catalogs, the hidden Postgres system catalogs. So it tells us which catalog, the table, catalog basically which database it's in, called Kingston New, the schema that the table's in, so they're all in what's called the data schema. I created a schema called data. Remember, schemas are like folders that you can store tables in, uh, data objects in, in your database. I've got the table name, district, focus area, NO2, postcode, postcode area. I've got the name of the column that's storing geometry. So in this case, they're all called, the columns are all called geom. That's the name of the column that stores the geometry data. We've got the dimensions of the geometry data type. So is it two-dimensional or three-dimensional? Yep. The SRID, spatial reference identifier, so that's the foreign key from spatial references. And we've got the type of, the actual type of spatial type. So this is a polygon. It's not just a polygon, it's a multi-polygon. Multi-polygon is where you can have parts, different spatially disjunct parts to your polygon, as opposed to just one single polygon, simple polygon. We've got points, we've got multi-line strings. So this is the information PostGIS requires to effectively register the spatial columns in the data. If you had a table with two columns, then you would have two rows in this in this uh, area. So for district, which is a district boundary, a polygon, if we had a point representation of the district, we would just have a new line in here, exactly the same as this, but the name of the common might be point geom, and it would have a different uh, character. SRID 27700 is the UK national. I didn't have any geography data loaded in, but it's exactly the same. Exactly the same information is stored for geography, geography columns. So that's data on the sphere. OK, I'm not going to talk about the raster stuff because I simply don't understand it. I had a quick look at it last week and decided that's going to take me a good few days to understand the raster system, so I'm not going to go into it at all. Um, all right, we'll do another little bit, and then we'll have a little break. OK, so first thing I want to point out is that versions matter, or they sometimes matter. So when you're finally having trouble, something won't load, something's in, you, the day, somebody's giving you a database dump, you can't load it up, uh, all sorts of things occur because you're running in a different version, your data was created in a different version. So for PostGIS, this is a PostGIS command, select version, this is not, sorry, this is Postgres command, not a PostGIS command. We want to know what version of Postgres we're running, we just do select version, and that returns us our Postgres version 9.3.5, um, you can see we're on a 32-bit um, 
the build it number is 1600. So this is all the information that I know need to know to know which version of Postgres we're running. So if somebody had created a database in a later version of Postgres, given me a copy, and then I find some of my functions don't work, well, that simply may be that the functions don't exist in the version, the older version that I'm using. Nothing, nothing amazing. Postgres also has a version. So if you need to know about Postgres versions, you can do select Postgres full underscore version, and that will return you a string that gives you the version of Postgres the version of the GEOS library that's being used, the version of the Proj4J library, the GDEL library, etc., etc. So, if you're ever having problems and you think it's a version problem, this is how you find out what version you're operating in, and then you can compare it to your colleague or whatever, wherever you got, say, data from the database for. So, how do we get data? create data in Postgres, spatial data. Well, we can create spatial objects very simply. Simply, on this is in memory, kind of in memory spatial objects. So if I want to create a point, I can use the select st point function. I pass in my X and Y. I'm not sure whether which way round it is, to be honest, whether it's X, Y, or Y, X. It's probably X, Y. So our coordinates are 11, 25, and I've called it the alias my point. So this just creates a point object in memory and returns that point object to us on, in our table, just like as our select statements do, they return tables. And it returns a binary representation of the spatial object. I believe it's in what's called well-known binary format. W, K, B, F, well-known binary format. And this is how, this is basically the spatial data stored in the, or created in the database. Note, we're creating just a, card, a simple point without any projection information. That's just a plain cool this is how stuff is stored actually in Postgres. It's just, if we want to create a point with a coordinate system, then we can use the set st set srid function as well. Okay, so this is creating a lat long point. The SRID, so in this case, we've got, we create a point at minus 77.433 longitude, 38.98 latitude. So SD point function creates our point. Then we assign, we use the STS set SRID function to set the spatial reference identifier for that point. So we embed, we can close that. There's our spatial reference identifier. So that's given us a binary representation of that point in WGS84. There's a useful function called stgeom from text, which is a useful generic syntax for creating various geometry types. So instead of this command, this function, we can create exactly the same point by, in a single function, using stgeom from text, and then we pass in a string that tells us what type of point it is, gives the coordinates, and then we can put a comma and we can put our SRID afterwards. And that creates exactly the same point as the last example, but in a different way. Here's an example of creating a line string using the John from ST text function. So this is just a line string with two points, two points a line between two points. We pass in our first pair of coordinates. Notice there's no comma between these, but there's a comma between the coordinate pairs. Again, SDRS is my line. 
there's our line. It's a bit more larger binary. So now we've created a line between those two points. If we want to get text, get stuff out, because we're not very good, humans aren't very good at write, reading binary. When I say, oh, just by the way, well, I mentioned that, okay. I'm saying things are binary, but you might be saying, my God, well, that's not binary, is it? That's Fs and As and all sorts of things like that in here. So, so, so what he's talking about, why is that binary? Isn't binary ones and zeros? What this is, is called a hexadecimal representation of a binary, so binary string. So basically, this is a huge string of zeros and ones representing the geometry. Hexadecimal is a, I'm not an expert on hexadecimal, but it's a base 16, it's basically base 16 numbers. So instead of printing all the zeros and ones, you turn all your zeros and ones, your binary string, into a base 16 number. And because it's base 16, you have to have, you go 1 to 10, and then you use A, B, C, D, E to represent the numbers up to 16, E, F. So this is a hexadecimal representation of the binary code that represents the geometry. So if we want to get out of our hexadecimal string, so I've just copied and pasted the previous one, I can use as a whole variety of these functions, I'm just giving you some examples of these functions, the as, st, as, e, k, w, t, uh, WKT stands for well-known text. Can't remember what the E stands for, but extended might be a possibility. Look it up. Uh, so it's turning this hexadecimal representation of a binary string back into a text format that we can read. So it, you can see that there's a point with these coordinates, and, the, and that's the SROID. And there's a whole variety of these functions that will return different text representations of the binary strings. We'll just finish the data import bit and then we'll, we'll have a little rest, a little break. So how do I get most my, my data in? Well, the thing I do most of the time is I import shape files from P in PG admin. So if I go to the plugins, you should have a post gist spatial shape file and DBF loader, which is a simple, nice graphical interface. Brings up this window here. We can uh, we can add a connection. We start off, we set up the connection, the local host, the port, standard things you should be familiar that you did with to establish the Postgres PG Admin 3 connection. You also need to do it for this uh, importer connection. We can simply press the add file button. We get a list of shape files in a directory. I've selected three of these. I've got one called basins. This is data for Mexican fish. One called basins, the drainage basins, polygons. One called budaids, which is the name of the, the family of fish that I'm interested in. These are points. And I've also got a line feature class called rivers, uh, which is a linear link. And in the import, you can see we can specify the schema that we want to import the data to. I'm just leaving it at public here. We've got the name of the column that we're going to score the, store the geometry. It's just called the default is geom. Unless you have some reason for changing the defaults, I wouldn't bother. I'd just stick with geom because that makes life easy. The SRID, that's the Lambert conformal conic SRID that I got from spatialreference.org. Ref, ref, and also, if you go on to options, you might want to, it's probably a good idea to make sure the create spatial index <laughs> automatically after load is ticked. It's recommended that you create spatial indexes whenever you import spatial data. So this will automatically create your index on load. We run it, chugga chugga chugga. Here we've got our three new tables in the public schema in our database. Basins, Kudayas, and Rivers. If we then look at our geometry columns, we can see we've got 
database Mexico public schema and we've got our data's imported all correctly and been registered in the database. We want to, uh, right, I think we better halt there for, uh, we take 10 minutes? Five past? Okay. <laughs>